to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ and the angel said to mary and you shall call his name jesus for he will save his people from their sins. Matthew chapter 1, verse number 21. Welcome to our series of lessons entitled, More About Jesus. When people think about the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we often think about Him in terms of the New Testament. And indeed, all of us want to shape our lives to learn more about Jesus and, and know more about His life. We want to follow in His footsteps. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 21. But as we initially think about learning more about Jesus, we want to realize that Jesus also is an amazing figure who plays a big part in the Old Testament scheme of redemption in both planning and prophecy. And so we welcome you today to our study of more about Jesus. As always, these lessons are being brought to you by members of the Lord's Church, the Church of Christ in your area. Would love for you to stop by and visit with them. If you'd like to have a Bible study, they'd be more than happy to do that with you. Also, here at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your study of God's Word and in your journey to know more about God and His will. You can visit us on our website, thegospelofchrist.com, where you can find a wide variety of Bible study materials, including DVDs, CDs, articles, study books, and things of that nature that will be a great benefit to you. And as always, if you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson, whether that be in video format on DVD, or you'd like to have an audio copy on CD, you can email us or call us or write to us, and we'd be happy to send that to you free of charge. We'll even pay the postage to get it there. As we think about Jesus in the Old Testament. It's not really an idea that we often associate with Christ. When people think about studying about Christ, we often turn to the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. And naturally, they tell us about the birth and the life and the death and resurrection of Christ. But today we want to initially think about learning more about Jesus as we look at Him in the Old Testament. Did you know that Christ was in the Old Testament? That He played an active part from Genesis all the way to the close of the Old Testament in the prophecies and planning of God's scheme of redemption? One might think, well, I never see Christ or I never much hear the words Jesus or Christ in the Old Testament. But friend, as we bring that together, as we bring the Old Testament prophecies and images together with their fulfillment in the New Testament, Christ becomes a major figure in those writings. Let me, let me introduce it this way. When we think about Christ in the Old Testament, do you realize that Christ, you can see His majesty and power at creation? That's right. Jesus was there and an active part of creation. For example, when you hear the words in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Who do we naturally think of? Well, naturally, we think of the Father. We think of His creative power. We think of the God, the Father, and the mastermind and architect of design. But friend, did you know that the New Testament records as well that Jesus was an active part of creation. Let me direct your attention to Colossians chapter 1. I want you to notice verses 15 and 16 with me. The scripture records, He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Now notice this, for by Him, by Christ, all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, 
visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through Him and for Him. That brings so much new light to the words of Genesis 1-1. When I hear God created the heavens and the earth, God spoke and the world came into existence. With this information in the New Testament, I realize that Christ, was there at creation that God in the Son, that He was an active part in that. God used Him in creation and all things were created by Him, through Him, and for Him. Listen to the words of Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2. The Bible says, God, who at various times and various ways spoke in time past, talking about the Old Testament, spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things, listen now, through whom also He created the world. And so again, confirmation, verification that Christ was an active part. And when I think of, when I think of creation, when I think of Christ, when I think of the, the majesty and power of, of God speaking and the world coming to existence, I need to include Christ into those thoughts. It was His majesty, His power, His divine nature that played a big part in that as well. Do you remember the words that initiate the Gospel of John? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by Him. Without Him there was nothing made that was made. Jesus again is seen as playing an active part in creation. But what's amazing about this is that you really don't have to look to the New Testament to understand that it wasn't just the work of the Father in creation. Let me illustrate. Take your mind back to that chapter in Genesis 1 again. Genesis chapter 1 teaches us all about creation. God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was about form and void. The Spirit of God hovered upon the face of the deep. Now, do you remember Genesis 1, verse number 26? What does that passage say? God said, listen now, let us make man in our image. Well, wait a minute. Who is that us? The scripture uses a personal plural pronoun to describe God. Who is that? The Father. Genesis 1, 1, the Spirit hovering upon the face of the deep, the Holy Spirit, Genesis 1, 2, and according to Colossians 1, 15 and 16, it is also the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so as I think about Christ in the Old Testament, as I think about His majesty and power at creation, how's that practical to us today? Friend, if Christ had the majesty and the power to speak, to be an active part and the world come into existence. Imagine what that majesty and power can do in my life and yours today if I'll only let it. You know, Christ stands at the door and knocks. Revelation 3 clearly teaches if we're willing to let Him come into our life, let Him to live and abide in His Word, have its free course in our life. Can you imagine what Christ's majesty and power can do in my life? Truly, couldn't we say, as Paul said toward the close of the Philippian letter, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, as we also think about Christ in the Old Testament, let's realize that not only is He found in Genesis chapter 1, in the initial pages of creation, in the very first part of that, but I want you to see Christ as we begin to work God's plan and God's scheme of redemption for saving man into God's full plan. Uh, do you remember Genesis chapter 3? Adam and Eve are living in the beautiful, luscious Garden of Eden. God gave them a command. Of every tree of the Garden of Eden you shall freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of God, good and evil you shall not eat it, for the day that you eat it you shall die therein. And so God says, you can have anything in this garden. I've made this special for you. Just don't eat the tree in the middle of the garden known as the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so as things begin to unfold, that serpent, Satan, enters the picture. And Satan tempts Eve. 
Why did God say that? He doesn't want you to be like Him. And so she looked at that tree with a longing eye and saw that it was good to eat, would make one wise. And she ate of that. And she gave to her husband Adam also, and he ate of that. Their eyes were open and they realized they were naked and they realized they had sinned. And friend, from that time, from that point in time when sin enters the world, Christ has been seen as coming into the world to save man from sin. Let me illustrate. Look in Genesis chapter 3, and I want to direct your attention with me to verse number 15. Here is God speaking to the serpent about what's going to happen to him. Genesis 3:15 records, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between her seed and your seed, he, now notice this, the seed of woman, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. When I think of those words to Satan, and I think about God making a plan and Satan, God says to Satan, I'm going to put enmity, I'm put division between you and woman, between, his, between you and the seed of woman, between him and you. He's going to bruise your head. You're going to bruise his heel. I, I can't help but hear the words of Romans 16, 26, where Paul said to Christians in the first century who through Christ were overcoming Satan, God shall crush Satan under your feet shortly. When Jesus died on the cross and He, through death, overcame Him who had the power of death, Hebrews 2.14, Jesus dealt that death blow to the head of the serpent. Yes, His foot was bruised. Yes, He suffered. He had to die. But look at God's plan even from the early days of Genesis in the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God's plan unfolding in the early chapters of Genesis not only includes Christ as the seed of woman destroying Satan but he's the one that you see that will bless all nations let me direct your attention to another passage in the Old Testament in the early days of the book of Genesis that clearly pictures Christ look in Genesis chapter 12 and I want you to notice what the scripture says in verses 1 through 3 with me the Bible records now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. Now watch, I will bless those who bless you, I will curse him who curses you, and in you, the idea in your seed, all the families of the earth, shall be blessed. And so here, we've got that great promise to Abraham. God gives him a command. I want you to leave your land. I want you to leave your family. I'm going to send you a new place. I'm going to start a whole nation through you and in your seed. All nations are going to be blessed. Now, for a long time, Israel missed that principle. In fact, in John chapter 8, when Jesus said God's able to raise up uh, seed to Abraham from these stones, the Jews were able to respond by saying, we've never been in bondage to anybody. We're, we're children of Abraham. We're the sons of promise. We've got that seed promise. And so they thought anybody who was a descendant of Abraham naturally was going to receive that promise. But they missed something very big. God did not say, in your seeds, all nations will be blessed. God said, in you, in your seed. Now, Paul makes that point in Galatians chapter 3 and clearly drives home that the fulfillment, the ultimate fulfillment of the promise to Abraham can only be had in Christ. Notice Galatians chapter 3, and I want you to listen to what the Scripture says beginning in verse number 16. The Bible says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. Now watch this. And he does not say, And to seeds as of many, but as of one, watch this, and to your seed who is Christ. That seed promise, in your seed all nations of the earth will be blessed. Who was that? Not plurality, but in a singularity. One person was going to be that chosen one who all nations of the earth, not just the Jews, all nations could be blessed. And to your seed, who is Christ. Friend, when we think about Christ in the Old Testament, we need to see Him as the ultimate and final plan 
that God set in motion through whom all nations could be blessed. Do, do we see the blessing of being a child of God? I'm not living in the day and age, nor are you, where we are looking forward to something better. I'm not living in a day and age where prophecies haven't been fulfilled. I'm not looking forward to someone greater coming. We're living in the reality of God's greatest plan and the unfolding of that in Christ Jesus. What a blessing it is to be a child of God. Ephesians 1, 3, all, listen to this, I think this ties right in with Genesis 12 and the nations being blessed. Ephesians 1, 3 says, all spiritual blessings are ours in Christ Jesus. Who's he talking to? Christians, members of the Lord's church in the first century. And so not only do I see Jesus in his majesty and his power at creation, I see him as the world's greatest blessing and the ultimate fulfillment of all plans that God set in motion. I then want to direct your attention to a passage also in the book of Genesis. In Genesis chapter 49, where the sons of Isaac and are being blessed, where the sons are being blessed there and Israel is giving those blessings to his children, I want you to notice what the Scripture will say about one of those in Genesis chapter 49, verse number 10. As these blessings unfold and as the prophecies are given, here we have the blessing that's going to come to the tribe of Judah and specifically to Jesus. Notice Genesis 49 Verse number 10, the Bible says, Jacob speaks to his children and says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. Here we see Jesus as the peace bringer, until Shiloh comes. That word Shiloh literally means peaceful one or peace bearer. You see, there had been a great enmity. There had been a great division. There had been a, a great separation between God and man throughout the ages because of sin. You remember that separation. Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2. Lord's ears not heavy that he cannot hear. His arms not shortened that he cannot save. But our sins and our iniquities have separated us from our God. It's something all men face, Romans 3, 23. Nobody can claim righteousness in and of themselves, Romans 3, verse 10. But the good news is that although, yes, there's been that separation, that, that chasm has existed, Jesus is the peace bringer. He brings God and man together in Himself. He is able to make of the two one new man thus making peace. Ephesians 2 verses 14 and 16 and Colossians chapter 2 verses 14 through 16. And so I see Christ when I, when I hear the angels. Jesus comes into the world. He's born and we've got His birth. And, and in Luke chapter 2, the angels sing at His birth, peace on earth. There's the fulfillment of Genesis 49, 10. Peace on earth and goodwill toward men. And so Christ in the Old Testament is that one who is going to bring peace between God and man to bridge the gap and to put us back in the goodwill of the Almighty. We also see Christ in the Old Testament in a parallel to Moses as the deliverer of His people. You remember Exodus chapters 1 through 12 where God raises up a deliverer by the name of Moses. Moses comes out of the wilderness of Midian, the backside of Midian, to bring God's people out of Egyptian bondage. With the help of his brother Aaron, the ten plagues are unleashed on the uh, Egyptian nation, nation. And as a result, uh, Moses, that great deliverer, is able to bring his people out of Egyptian bondage. And with his guidance and with uh, encouragement and, and a little prodding, they head toward that promised land. Now the next generation is actually the one who inherits that promised land, but Moses is seen as a deliverer, as one who brings God's people out of bondage and who ultimately takes them into the promised land. Now I want you to see the parallel. In Scripture, between Moses and one who is risen, who is greater than Moses. Hebrews makes this parallel. In Hebrews chapter 3, as we think about 
why Christ is greater, some of the things uh, about Jesus that are indeed better, the Hebrews writer will show us that Christ is indeed greater than Moses. Look in Hebrews chapter 3, beginning in verse number 1. The scripture records, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus. Now watch, who was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was faithful in all his house. For this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. There's no doubt that in the mind of the Hebrews writer, he parallels Christ and how he's greater than Moses. Well, Moses did great things. Great miracles, great deliverer, great leader, right up to the edge of the promised land. But Christ is so much greater as a deliverer of his people. Think about what Moses did. Moses delivered God's people out of Egyptian bondage. And hey, that was a wonderful thing. Don't get me wrong. But Christ, does He not deliver us from a greater bondage? Romans 6 verses 17 and 18 tells us, God be thanked. Though you were the slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. Verse 18 says, if you give yourself to sin in essence, you're a slave of sin. When Christ came into the world, there was a greater bondage. It was not bondage to Pharaoh, bondage to brick making. No, it was bondage and slavery to sin and Satan. Christ delivers us from that bondage. Romans 6 verse 23, the wages of sin is death. But listen to the, the, the release, the, the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. When we hear the words of Acts 2 verse 38, repent and be baptized, here's the release for the remission of your sins. There's the freedom from sin that Christ gives all men. Christ as a, a type of Moses is leading us toward that promised land itself. If I walk in the footsteps of Jesus, 1 Peter 2 verse 21, Revelation chapter 14, I'm headed toward that great home in the sky, that great heaven that we often think of in, in so many beautiful images. And so what a wonderful picture that we have as Christ as a type indeed of Moses. But now I want you to see Christ as the ultimate sacrifice, that spotless Lamb of God in the Old Testament scene in the types of the animals and shadows, but in Christ in its ultimate fulfillment. In the book of Leviticus, uh, as one enters into thinking about and studying sacrifice and sin in the Old Testament, in the book of Leviticus, there was a way to be redeemed from sin. That was no doubt dependent upon Christ. Hebrews 9 verses 15 through 17 teaches, but there were sin offerings. If one sinned under the Old Testament, there could be a lamb, there could be a heifer, there could be two turtle doves offered for that sin, and it was a, indeed a bloody sacrifice. And, and what stands out as striking about this is the words of Hebrews 10, verses 3 and 4. The blood of bulls and goats could never really take away sin. I love the words of John as he sees Jesus approaching. In John 1, verse 29, John sees Jesus. In essence, he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's Jesus. Hebrews 4.15, He was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. He was spotless. Uh, 1 Peter 1 verses 18 and 19, knowing that you are not redeemed from your aimless conduct uh, by tradition or things laid down by your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ. As a lamb without spot or blemish, He was foreordained before the foundations of the world, but was manifest in these last days for us. When I think of Christ in the Old Testament, in the multitude of, of animal sacrifices that were made, Christ stands out as that one eternal sacrifice made for all men. How do we know that? Listen to the words of Hebrews 10, verse number 12. The Hebrew writer, as he thinks about the Old Testament, as he thinks about the multitude of, of bloody sacrifices that were made, says this, this man, Jesus, after he'd offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Christ made one sacrifice, not a multitude. He's that perfect 
spotless Lamb of God who gave Himself as a sacrifice for all men so that they indeed could be saved. Now, the final thing that we mention about Jesus in the Old Testament is clearly seen in the major prophet Isaiah. Isaiah reveals to us some great details about Jesus in the Old Testament as that suffering servant who would make the ultimate sacrifice for all men. Let me mention some of those verses to you. Isaiah chapter 53, beginning in verse number 3, the Bible says, Of this one he is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely He has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed Him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. Listen, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him, and by His stripes we are healed. Who is this suffering servant in Isaiah 53? who's bruised, who's smitten, who is looked upon in a negative light and does all of it for someone else? Friend, a perfect parallel to the words of Isaiah 53, 5 are found in 1 Peter 2, 24. Peter identifies that suffering servant by saying, He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him. By His stripes we are healed. The Bible says He Himself bore our sins in His own body upon the tree. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 24. And so, as we initially began to think in this series of lessons about more about Jesus, we hope that you'll study deeper into the Old Testament, that it will give, you a, give us a, a richer understanding of God's plan, of what Jesus went through, of His leaving heaven to come to this earth, and of the multitude of things that were fulfilled about Him in the Old Testament. But friend, most of all, as we began by saying, when the angel said to Mary, you'll call his name Jesus. He'll save his people from their sins, Matthew 1, We ask you today, has Jesus had the opportunity to save you from your sins? Have you allowed him to do just that? Have you heard the message about Christ? Romans 10, verse 17. Do you believe Jesus is God's Son? John 8, 24. Would you change your life and repent? Luke 13, 3. Would you make that good confession? Jesus is the Christ. And would you be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins? Acts 2, 38. We hope you'll continue with us as we study more about Jesus. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is taking the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we do and say. And unlike many other religious groups, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. We encourage you to visit us at thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com, call us at 580-798-7656, or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. Be the glory. This is the gospel of Christ.